Good evening, everyone. I'm Vicki Hayward, and I'm chairman of the RSA, and I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to our inaugural lecture. Um, just before we begin, could I ask you to make sure that your mobile phones are switched to silent, or preferably turned off altogether, so they don't sort of hum away in your pocket. Uh, we are live streaming this event this evening, so welcome to those of you that are watching us on the website. Uh, and a reminder that the hashtag is hashtag RSA chairman if you wish to tweet and get involved in the discussion that way. Now, it's very, my very great pleasure to welcome Sir Martin Davidson this evening, Chief Executive of the British Council. Um, he was knighted for his services to British cultural, scientific and educational interests worldwide in the 2014 New Year's Honours. Martin's commitment to international relationships have been a constant feature of his career since, as a young English graduate, he went first to Hong Kong as an administrative officer. When he joined the British Council as assistant representative in Beijing in 1984, um, China, the British Council operation in China was just six people working in a converted bicycle shed in the British Embassy. And in those days, how life has moved on, it was illegal for a Chinese national to speak to a foreigner. Martin played a pivotal part in building this fledgling presence up to its present strength of now more than 230 people in four state-of-the-art offices, and I'm pretty sure we can now say they're very actively in discussion with as many Chinese nationals as they possibly could be. Martin's held various posts in the British Council, geographical directorate with responsibilities that have included South East Europe in a particularly troubled time in that region's history, the Middle East, East Asia, and the Americas. <laughs> in his lecture this evening, Martin will reflect on the transformed global environment we currently find ourselves in and consider whether creativity, the cultivation and sharing of the power to create that lies in all of us, offers the UK a way ahead amidst the race for global relevance. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Sir Martin Davidson. Thank you very much. Vicky, thank you very much indeed. Um, and could I start by saying what a huge pleasure it is uh, to be able to speak to you uh, this evening. Um, a distinguished audience in a marvellous location. Um, and even better, just a short walk away from the British Council, though inevitably that meant I was later than I should have been. Um, the RSA has a reputation as a provocateur of many of the conversations about the things that really matter in this country, and indeed beyond our borders. And I'm particularly pleased to have been invited to give the Chairman's lecture on the subject that is linked loosely and with a great free reign, naturally, to the RSA's overarching theme of creativity. Creativity is, I believe, part of the human condition. There are, of course, differences in terms of opportunities, whether through the genetic lottery of talent or of access to education, skills, and opportunities. But creativity has nonetheless been around since the beginning of the human experience. And just as we have the power to create as individuals, it is the act of sharing this creativity, the exchange of cultural artifacts, ideas, and ways of doing things, that has been a powerful golden thread that runs through human history. The power to create is not only a capacity for individuals, it is dependent upon connections between them, on the sharing of the creativity that they generate. And it is this sharing of creativity that I would like to focus on, because I believe that as well as the noble drive of the RSA to embed creativity in all human activity, as enabling us to lead richer lives, it is through the sharing of creativity that we can deliver benefits at the human, national and international level. I will argue that for the UK in particular, our creativity and this use of our creativist assets is critical to our remaining relevant in the world. Now, sharing creativity has an immensely long history. It can come from a variety of motives, more or less noble, to gain influence as a key medium of exchange of value, a means of building ideas to display ingenuity, talent or power, to curry favour, or simply to share what we have, think or create as an expression of who we are. Human communities have already done this. Around 28,000 BC, as humans made their way across Europe, Venus figurines 
statuettes depicting the female form has changed hands from group to group and travelled far. Although we probably don't know the cultural significance now, their significance was undoubtedly cultural and carried with it powerful messages of identity, belief, a sense of place in the world, relationships to other groups, as well as a display of technical prowess or economic resources needed in their production. Knowledge and ideas have been exchanged more systematically through the institutions such as the Great Library at Alexandria and the great medieval universities, as well as in the courts of the powerful. There were places where ideas met, ideas creating the powerful exponential racket, ratchet effect that has only increased in recent times. And states have always shared their cultural assets and artifacts, whether for power, display, or the open search for the innovative, the creative, to help drive and stimulate their own knowledge or prosperity. When Zheng He sailed from China in the early 15th century in command of a huge armada to establish a Chinese presence far afield, as far as Eastern Africa, and impress other countries, his holes, holds were filled with gifts such as porcelain and silk to dispense as he went along. And in return, he received novelties such as a giraffe. And as he went amongst strangers, the interactions which eased and uh, cemented this exchange of items that perhaps impressed, excited, excited wonder, or even worried the other, but which certainly created connections and told something about each side. But more of the story of Zheng He later. This cultural creative exchange has continued even though, through the tumultuous uh, changes of the past 80 years. The British Council was founded in 1934 in response to concern that the fascist regimes in Europe were telling a better story than we were, and the express purpose of developing closer cultural relations between the UK and other countries. In 1941, when scenes like the one above were common in our streets, a predecessor of mine wrote in our annual report, the constant interchange of knowledge, ideas and discoveries was always the life of Europe in its wiser days. It is rightly now no less the life of the world. Neighbourliness, as it may be called, has spread in widening circles since the day when a man in the next country was a, a foreigner, until our neighbours are in the Americas and the China Seas no less than in Western Europe. To foster that interchange in the interests of a peaceful and happy international relationship is rightly to be regarded as a function of the prudent state. They certainly wrote better in those days, or at least less bureaucratically. <laughs> in the 80 years of British Council's life, we've moved through a succession of turbulent ages. But this exchange has never really broken down, even though at times it was constrained by walls. Even during the Cold War, academic and professional exchanges and visits and the exchange of theatrical and musical performances continued. For example, a tour by the Old Vic to Moscow in 1961, just before the world went to the precipice of nuclear war. A confidential note sent by, by the British Embassy to one of my predecessors about that tour said, the visit has been an unqualified success, they always are. The company have played day after day, matinees as well as evening performances to packed houses. The reception received from the audience was invariably enthusiastic and the number of curtain calls was usually between 6 and 12, a very high score indeed for Moscow. I love the idea of somebody sitting there and actually counting the curtain calls. The tour aroused enormous interest among the theatrical and film people. I have been told that Russians are revising their whole concept of Macbeth after seeing the Old Vic performance. Again, I love the idea of, I'm not quite sure what the Russians' concept of Macbeth was in 1961, but it obviously was interesting. But he, the, 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 the ambassador goes on to say, official Moscow has also shown unusual interest. Kuznetsov, the acting minister for foreign affairs, told me he had seen all three plays and was full of obviously genuine praise. Kenneth James was told by the director of the filial that Mikoyan, who is not particularly well disposed towards the British, saw all three plays. Mrs. Khrushchev went to five or six times. And as you will have seen from the newspapers, Khrushchev himself, Mikoyan and Furzetsa, the minister of culture, all attended last night's performance of the importance of being earnest. Now that was written in January 1961. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't stop the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> but it is interesting to see the ripple of creative impact on the Moscow theatrical world. And that really is the first of my key points. All too often, a discussion about soft power, 
which I must say is not a term I particularly like, is seen as a conflict with hard power, as if they are mutually exclusive approaches that a nation might use in foreign affairs. They are not, however, alternatives. They're not things if you can't do one, you can't do the other. No one is fool enough to believe, think that sending Shakespeare to Moscow would have stopped a nuclear standoff, or now stop the changing of the borders in Europe by force. But what it can do is to maintain links and relationships at times of great strain and build a sense of commonality, which is vital for the better times. The world has, of course, moved on since then, cycling through what Gideon Rackman has called the ages of transformation and optimism, when the opportunities for creative exchange have multiplied as the world becomes more connected. This seemed to have reached a peak of possibility with the Rackman's age of optimism, when nothing seemed to stand in the way of open borders, win-win growth for all, and when even the global spread of McDonald's seemed to be a token of an interconnected, mutually dependent world the virtuous ratchet effect of swirling innovation. But this all began to change in 2001. And then with the financial difficulties, and as we enter Rackman's age of anxiety, all the threats, fractures and fears that it brings, what is the place of creative exchange? What is the place for creativity? In a world when interconnectivity is a source of anxiety and perhaps fear, where the problems of environmental degradation, disease, economic interdependence, political realignments, all cross borders indifferent to the wishes and efforts of states and governments, one might well argue that there are more pressing issues than sharing nice ideas. I would argue, however, that it is more important now than ever. It is more important now precisely because of the transformed environment we find ourselves in. And that very interdependence means it is only through building international relationships of mutual interest and mutual value that we can create the capacity to manage the issues we confront. What are some of the elements of these changes? In our present day environment, connections of value have moved decisively from elite to elite to people to people. In the late 1970s, my predecessor visiting Manila saw the high point of his call on Imelda Marcos. In 2013, the highlight from my attendance at Chogham in Colombo, we're visiting our day-long fair with the People to People Forum and the Youth Forum, and ensuring that young people from the UK were actively linked with fellows from across the Commonwealth. It is also a shift from the state to individuals. It's a modern truism that social media has transformed how people, especially the young, engage with each other. Anyone with a phone has become a broadcaster. Anyone with a Twitter account has become a journalist. I hope there are lots of journalists in here tonight. Um, and that, in many parts of the world, these sources are much more likely to be trusted than any form of traditional media. And we've also seen a shift from centralization to localization, and perhaps also paradoxically from centralization to internationalization. The assertion of other identities in a more or less controlled or violent way, which are often subsumed under what seemed in the not so distant past to be secure and rigid state structures, which seemed, which seemed inviolable. It is interesting that the sykes pico Treaty, um, something which we have all forgotten until very, very recently, um, which is the uh, figure on the top of that slide, and the extent to which people are refinding those old boundaries, and perhaps the terrible impact of ISIS on uh, Syria and Iraq is in some senses a refinding of some of those old boundaries and those sen old senses of identity. It all adds up to the loss of state control and the application, am amplification of other voices for good or ill. And a number of accelerators are pushing this even faster. The exponential growth and creativity. The non-state actors who now have the communication tools that were previously only available to states. The loss of trust in and belief in the intermediary. This all means an escalation in the power to create and the power to share. And also that this is all the more important. In cloud cultures, Charles Ledbetter highlighted this explosive growth of cultural expression. 
his equation ran, more cultural heritage stored in digital form, plus more accessibility to more people, plus people more be better equipped with more tools to add creativity to the collection, equals exponential growth in mass cultural expression, and that equals cloud culture. It feels like a good summary of the power to share and create. And this changing set of environments leads to my second set of key issues. Cultural exchange has moved and moved radically in the last 10 to 15 years from an elite to a mass activity, from a state to state to a people to people, from an authority based and authoritative to personal, anecdotal and episodic, and from centralized and institutional to both local and global at the same time. What does this all mean for the UK? What is this environment of hyper-connectivity, the rise of other voices, anxieties and shifting gravity of power mean for the golden thread of creativity and exchange? It means that it becomes more and more important in order for the UK to maintain its role, influence, prestige and prosperity in the world. And critically, as the, as the critical stimulus for our own creativity, by remaining a central node to global networks of knowledge and ideas. We can see the geopolitical rebalancing of the 21st century and the UK's place and dependence in this slide. There are many forecasts of the future, but all, virtually all of them has the UK with the potential of being a key player, whether that's the MOD's forecast of, gro of growth or Jim O'Neill's slightly more bullish that by 2050, the UK will be the, UK, the EU's largest country by population, its largest economy, and the only European economy in the top 10. But even more than those projections of growth, openness to exchange is fundamental to the UK now. The UK is exposed and knitted in the world more than almost any other country. Even in the crude measures of the UK's exports of goods and services, of the proportion of GDP, the UK is second only to Germany in major countries as uh, exposed to the rest of the world. And we can see this link even more when we look at the creative industries. According to government figures, the UK's creative industries are now worth £71.4 billion per year to the UK economy, with growth of almost 10% in 2012 and accounted for 5.6% of UK jobs in that same year. The value of services exported by the creative industries was 15.5 billion in 2011, or 8% of the total UK service exports. And when we, see this, when we look at this link, we can see it even more clearly when it comes to higher education. It is clear that sharing our education system supports the UK's creativity. The UK higher education system is one of the most internationalised in the entire world. 18% of our student base is international. More than 25% of the faculty of uh, universities are non-EU. And more than 80% of UK institutions have international partnerships. The Department for Business, Innovation and Skills estimates that in 2011 to 12, overseas students studying at higher education institutions in the UK paid £3.6 billion in tuition fees and more than £6 billion in living expenses. But much more importantly than this, international science and engineering students are critical to our engineering and research base and creativity in our sciences. They're the underpinning of viability of pioneering research programmes in engineering, medicine and science that are essential to the UK's success in the global economy. About 90% of all full-time postgraduate taught students in biotechnologies and some engineering programs are international. Any fall in the numbers of these students poses a fundamental threat to the UK's long-term research base, not just in terms of reduced income from fees, but much more importantly, from the loss of innovative thinking, intellectual challenge, and experience of difference that these Brit students bring to academic departments. And critically, in the reputation of the UK, which is a vital ingredient to driving this success. And we can see this when we look at scientific research. As this visual shows, the UK occupies a central position in the global collaboration network. 
According to research by Elsevier for the uh, Department for Business, 47.5% of all UK articles in 2012 resulted from international collaboration. And UK international co-authorship is typically associated with high field-weighted citation impact for both partners. We can even see this when we look at creativity in the way we organise our society and the impact that this has on international perceptions of our country. That was seen most recently in the Scottish referendum. Uh, I've just come back from a weekend conference uh, with uh, Italy and the Italians wanted to spend a huge amount of time talking about Scotland and the referendum. Whatever your views of the actual result, and I have to say, despite a Russian MP's claim that the Crimean referendum was much fairer and was a model <laughs> of democracy, I'm not sure the rest of the world actually sees it this way. Perhaps unsurprisingly, one UK commentator called it an, an energetic exercise of democracy. But perhaps more surprisingly, a Chinese commentator tweeted that no one had lost the referendum. The UK shows that the world is political civilization and shows other regimes, which only show their muscle and use force, how there are alternatives to handling disputes. So, this exchange of creativity helps secure our prosperity and place in the world. International cultural exchange plays to the UK's strengths and gives us an edge in an increasingly competitive international environment. We are an attractive country. Being and remaining so is a critical part of maintaining the virtuous circle of attracting more ideas and stimuli to feed our own creativity, whether that is through scientists coming to universities or our creative young people being stimulated what they see and learn overseas. But there are ever more voices, more competition, doing more to stimulate their own position in a network world. The UK must, through its links and connections, maintain its central place in the networks of information and creative ideas. Not to do so means cutting us out of the flow of ideas. The dramatic increase in the global in presence of the Confucius Institutes is something that we all know about, but other countries are doing much more. India, China, Korea, Brazil, all are investing substantially in the continuing development of those sorts of links. The Russian government recently tripled the budget of RT, its big broadcaster, in order to boost its voice around the world. So, we have a challenge. We also have a good track record, and we have fantastic assets. The first thing is that we should be more confident. We have a strong creative assets that the world is attracted to, and we have the international networks and relationships to share them for mutual benefit. We have a great starting point. We must sustain and grow these assets at home. This means a vibrant and creative arts sector and an education system attractive and attracting the rest of the world. We also need to be humble and listen. Creativity is not something we can have in isolation. No matter what we do here at home or what sums of money we throw at that creativity, to thrive, creativity needs to be stimulated. And the stimulate, stimulus can often come from other places. And so we need to have the skills to listen and see and not just to talk and show. And this leads to my third proposition, that effective cultural relations have a vital contribution to make to ensure the long-term viability, vitality, and prosperity of the UK. But that effectiveness is dependent upon four things. That we ensure a mutuality of benefit, that we ensure a mutuality of interest, that it is people, not government-based, and that we invest in the long-term slow burn of cultural relations if we're going to achieve the benefits that we seek. We also need to identify and remove important barriers. We need a population with the international experience, confidence, networks and language skills to be able to create, share and compete in an increasingly competitive international environment. While formal qualifications and skills remain important, intercultural skills as integral to the workplace and individuals need to be able to navigate successfully across borders. The problem is our young people do not often navigate borders as part of their education. A generous estimate suggests that 6% of all UK students take a placement overseas. 
That compares with 25% of all German students at the moment and the declared intention of the German government to grow that to one third of all students within the next five years. It is young, the young people of other countries that are taking up the opportunities to build skills and the skills needed to compete in the world. Our children need language skills to enable them to confidently negotiate the rest of the world. Without these skills, it becomes difficult to build the relationships, networks on trust on which cooperation and creative exchanges can be built. The British Council's report, Languages of the Future, suggested that three quarters of the UK public are unable to speak any of the ten languages most important to the UK's future, well enough to even have a simple conversation. Even with the best education system in the world, this deficit constrains the development of a world-beating knowledge economy. Writ large, this risks the UK as a whole being constrained in its ability to make its way in the world. And this leads to my fourth proposition. A continued success in a global and competitive world requires a globally connected population with the skills and experience which match or are superior to those offered by others. And that exposure to the rest of the world through languages, cultural fluency and personal experience are a prerequisite to success. I will end by returning to the story of Zheng He. You remember I started with the Ming Dynasty Admiral. As it illustrates a future that I do not want to see for our country, the kind of future that a vibrant country can have if it stops sharing its creativity with others and stops using difference and diversity as a stimulus for its own creativity. When Zheng He returned to uh, China, uh, the uh, Ming naval efforts declined dramatically. The hygiene in edict turn, helped turn China away from the oceans and ushered in a period of relative isolation from the creative swirl of the world. A period with ears and eyes closed to creative acts taking place in other parts of the world and with a corresponding loss of internal creativity and vigour which this brought. Now I'm no economist but I think you can trace the beginnings of the long-term decline of China to that very decision. When China turned its back on the wider world, and China's share of global worth declined from an estimated 30% in 1600 to under 5% in 1970. And it was only with the return of the Age of Transformation, where Deng Xiaoping helped bring China back into the world, that China reconnected and arguably began its reassertion of its rightful position. It's that future that Ming brought to their own country that I do not wish to see our next generation have. And partly this is a matter of choice. The choice not to turn inwards, but it's also a question of competitive edge, of being clear that this space, the space where the opportunities benefit from the sharing of creativity exist, is becoming more congested and the UK needs to invest in it and to get it right. And this leads to my final thought. Get it right both in terms of the creativity that we generate and the means, tools and energy with which we share it inter internationally will fuel not just our long-term prosperity but the power of all of us to be creative. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Martin, and, um, and I have the luck of being able to ask the first question, um, and then I will, I will hand it uh, out to the floor. Um, what I really loved about what you were saying was that you, you took this uh, a, a debate that I have been struggling with, with how to articulate to, to a, a much further and deeper point, um, which I would just like you to open up on a little bit more, which is this issue of isolationism versus... Um, um, collaboration and, and us organizations and organizations that are interested in things like fellowships such as the RSA are, are natural uh, collaborators but we are perhaps living uh, in, in a time that is strangely uh, uncollaborative people mm. are looking at the UK as a place that should 
close its mind to the outside world. Perhaps we should withdraw from Europe. Perhaps we should close our borders uh, to further immigration. And you're really laying uh, culture right in the heart of, of that debate. Would you just talk a little bit more about how you can see how the connectivity between those two, two things could be of, of benefit to try to change that drift? I suppose it starts... Uh in, in my mind, with a, a core belief, which I think is a well-evidenced belief, is that creativity is dependent upon connection. Mm. Um, and in a much more interconnected world, and where, a world which is much more uh, competitive in this space, our creativity, our ability to, to continue to build and sustain the creativity that we already have, and the fantastic creativity we have in this country, is vitally dependent on our ability to connect with elsewhere. Because there are extraordinary things happening all around the world. So if you go to Colombia, uh, for example, a country which is investing deeply in trying to build its own creative industries and is connecting into its long-term uh, historical connections with, with uh, native peoples across the Andes, that is driving a new sense of creativity. Now, we need to have people who understand that and are part of that and can bring that back to inform our own creativity here. What worries me more than anything else, I see right around the world those countries who are open to and prepared to face up to the challenges of that, interna that, that international interconnectedness and those countries which are afraid of it. And I personally believe that a lot of the problems we actually have in all sorts of parts of the world are driven as much by fear that I am not going to be able to be successful in this much more difficult world, that people won't understand and respect my culture, they won't understand and respect my background, they won't understand and respect my creativity. That drives a reaction, a response, which is often, uh, can often become violent and certainly uh, extremely uh, aggressive. And for me, a country which looks in on itself instead of outwards f risks the, uh, that, 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 that closing off from the wellsprings of creativity. Now, our creativity in this country is not going to decline precipitously um, in any more than the, the, the Chinese did in, in, in the 17th and 18th century. But unless you're connected to and continuing to refresh that, you will be, it will begin to become more and more sclerotic. And I think that's the danger that we face if we don't continue to not just want to engage with the rest of the world, but actually put our energy into giving our people the skills to be able to engage with the rest of the world. Mm. Thank you very much. Interestingly, yes, recently stated, not made in China, but designed in China. Yeah. And that's a very interesting um, aspiration that the Chinese have. But also, the, the, if you look at, uh, at China, and we, we all hear a lot about PISA statistics on education and so on, um, and... But what is interesting, if you talk to the Chinese, if you talk to the Singaporeans, if you talk to the Malaysians and Taiwanese, all of whom are doing extremely well in those, those charts, they look to us to understand how you also incorporate creativity into your education system. Because um, that is something which they actually believe is of vital value to them in being able to, to take forward their own economy. Yeah. Thank you. So, questions. We have a microphone, which means that people at home can hear what you're saying. So I'm going to go straight to the front row here. Thank you. And then, uh, should we take a, a second one in the, in the middle there? If the microphone we need can go. To, um, introduce ourselves? Yes, please. Uh, I am David Alexander from University College London. I wonder whether the British government hasn't lost the plot when it comes to soft diplomacy. The Prime Minister of Japan is a graduate of my university, he comes back to visit. But now the tuition fees are so extortionate and the visa policies are so hostile that weekly we turn away the world's best talent because we cannot afford to have them with us. Thank you. Can I take a second point as well in the middle there and then we'll take Thank you. Time. Um, yes, I mean, your idea of uh, uh, intensifying um, and shared um, global creativity, that's a wonderful idea. Of course, you have taken the UK-centric view, obviously, as a director of the British Council, you had to. But, you know, this intensifying global, globally shared creativity, uh, where would it lead us? Where would it lead the, the world? Would it lead us, to, would we still be worrying about which country has a better GDP, or we will be having different ways of measuring which country is, uh, is uh, probably uh, their, yes, the ranking order, their, uh, uh, yes, uh, how, what might be the consideration of ranking uh, the world 
wrecking the, the, uh, the current nations uh, in the world to come, where we have more shared and perhaps uh, less divisive, divisive world. Sorry, am I clear my question or not? Yep. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> so those two first, and then we'll move um, over here, yes. I do think that the, 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 our ability to continue to attract students into this country is, is, is a vitally important uh, aspect. Um, uh, I worry, and I, we have uh, both in, organizationally and, and individually argued very strongly against or about the, the, the nature of the visa policy. I think the, the issue around visas, um, and I, you know, I don't want to get too deeply into it because it's a, a long and, and rather turgid subject, but the, the problem is not so much the exact details of the visa policy, which by and large is, is, is not that dissimilar from many other countries. The real problem is the, 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 the message we're sending out to other parts of the world. Yeah. And the message is we don't really want you to come here. Something which uh, our politicians really don't quite get is that if you issue a statement which is designed for domestic uh, political consumption, you are far more likely to get it on the front pages of the New Straits Times and on the front pages of the Hindu Times than you will ever get it on the front pages of the Times here in London. Um, and these messages fly around the world at an extraordinary rate. And the net result has been that our student numbers from India, which is a vitally important country for us to engage with, have halved over the last three years. Um, and that is a serious issue, I would argue. My own perception is that cost is less of an issue. Um, of course, fees are, are, are high, but um, uh, I also think that the, 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 while the change in, visa f in fees for, for domestic students has been substantial, the change in fees for overseas students has been uh, significantly less, if, if not uh, none at all. Um, uh, and certainly all the experience we have is that uh, both countries and individuals are prepared to pay that if they feel they are getting value for money. Um, and there's no question that, of course, it would be good to be able to attract more. But I think the, v the, 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 the sense of an open country willing and prepared to welcome people is, is the critical issue. And the question of, of, of cultures um, and... Uh, I suppose what the thought was going through my mind as you were asking that question is, is actually the danger a homogenization of culture of the kind that the French have famously fought against in, for example, their, their approach to, to, to the, the free trade agreement with the United States and so on? Is that actually a, a critical issue? Or is actually that connectivity between countries and, and creative connectivity actually a stimulus for difference, a stimulus for, for the new. And I would say that certainly my experience, if you look at, as I said earlier, the countries like Colombia, if you look at the, the work that Sri Lanka is doing in developing its, its textile designing, uh, if you look at uh, the way in which China is investing in hugely in uh, development of uh, creative uh, uh, assets, that those connections actually can create new and, and, and exciting forms of creativity rather than the homogenization. And I think, again, fear of homogenization drives us towards closing down rather than opening up. And I think that our overall prosperity is much more about opening up. Mm. I think the, the other thing to say about the, your, your question, the UK is, without question, one of the most attractive countries in the world. Not because our GDP exceeds other people's, not because our growth is greater than other people's, but for a whole variety of issues. And I would say that they're really about our, creative, our attractive assets, which are our language, um, our education system and access to it, and our creativity. Those three things are massive driver uh, of attraction for our country, and we derive a great deal of benefit from that. Interesting that, that, that the rhetoric recently has not been for us to be that proud about our educational system, and yet that our educational system is something that people are immensely uh, jealous of and interested in emulating around the rest of the world. Yes, there's a question at the back. Yeah, Ian Dodds. Um, I actually uh, work with uh, all sorts of organisations to help them um, get uh, build more creative and high-performance uh, cultures through the power of inclusion. My question is to do with inequality. It seems to me that a barrier to creativity that now exists in this country is that there's more inequality 
than there has been for the last 30 years. So that if you look right across almost all the employment sectors, um, you'll find that there's a very high proportion of people from privileged backgrounds in the top jobs. And even if, uh, I'm, even if you look at the creative arts, um, I'm, I'm actually doing some work in that area now. In fact, uh, it's, it's much more difficult to succeed in the creative arts if you come from a less privileged background than it was 30 years ago. And I do honestly think this has to be a barrier to creativity. Thank you very much. I'm um, just to say I'm Chairman of the Warwick Commission on the Future of Cultural Value and that's um, a point we're um, considering and how to respond to that uh, a, a great deal. Do you have any other comments to add to that? I, I, I only to say that I absolutely agree with you. I, I, and one of the things which I think is particularly pernicious is the expectation that young people should uh, start their work, working career without being paid um, through internships and other, mm. other uh, uh, forms. And actually, it is up to us as leaders of our own organisations to ensure that we don't allow that to happen. Um, and one of the things that we've done in the British Council is we now insist on paying minimum wage to uh, young interns. Mm. And we get superb value out of them. But I have absolutely no doubt, that, and we have serious issues ourselves about how we become much more inclusive in the way we, in which we employ people. Um, and that is both uh, across uh, different uh, backgrounds, whether those are of ethnicity, of uh, gender, of uh, social background, or indeed of geographical background. Um, I think we all know intrinsically that the, those, those bring huge benefits this also brings a lot of, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of disturbance within, within a system. It's much easier to run an organisation when everybody's the same. It's actually really boring too, but um, uh, you do need that sense of disturbance within your, your ecosystem of an organisation to really get the creativity that you're looking for, and which you need to be successful. Yes, two people have microphones and then I'll take... Um, Rick Hall, thank you very much for your uh, talk, Sir Martin. Um, I'll try and link two points, if I may. Uh, one is about cost. Uh, when, you, when you made the reference to cost not being a sig well, the major factor, um, I saw David Alexander shaking his head quite vigorously in the front row there. Um, and I, I suspect that cost is a major factor in all respects of how to nurture creativity. Another feature of this, another symptom, if you like, um, are the, uh, the access to places in drama schools, which are becoming you know, more and more the preserve of people who can uh, be supported by parents and, uh, and so on. Um, now, the other point is about creativity and education. And we are in an age, I, I fear, where actually a, a creativity is becoming less valued in our education system rather than more, partly because I suspect it's not measurable. And of course, we're obsessed by a culture of if it ain't, if you can't measure it, it doesn't count. Somebody else got the microphone. We'll take that question as well. And then this gentleman, the red tie in front of Rick, is also waiting to ask a question. Yeah. Yes, at the back. Yeah, my name is Alistair Lenster, design engineer. You've been a lot of this discussion about the importance of creative influences at a higher educational level, which is essentially elite academic in a sense. How, what about the importance of getting creativity at the other level of manufacturing, so the apprenticeship level, so that creativity is not seen as a preserve as an elite uh, uh, you know, attitude, but something which actually should be inf infused right through society? Absolutely. And we'll take the, the next point. And if the microphone could go to this gentleman here with the scarf. Hi. Hi, Sean Glasgow, a fellow here at the RSA. I, I was quite intrigued by your um, example of China closing its border. And to be a bit provocative with that, um, there was an economist article on China a couple weeks ago. And basically what it talked about was some hesitation of the Chinese government due to the fact that um, when it was closed, that basically the ultimate consumer good, opium, was imported into China, there was all the colonialism and that type of thing, then you have what happened in the Soviet Union. And to me, the most powerful things 
are two things. It's creativity and it's also trust. So the fear that many of these regimes have about letting the West in consumer goods and that type of thing, um, if, if you could address that, I'd be very interested. Thank you. Um, perhaps I'll take that, that one first. Um, it was very interesting that uh, about three years ago, President Hu Jintao, um, then president of China, and the wonderfully named uh, communist organ called Speaking Truth, um, uh, issued a, a very, very clear statement, which was that China is under attack by cultural influences from outside. And those cultural influences, unless countered, will undoubtedly undermine the position of the Chinese Communist Party and that China needs to counter those, both in terms of what it allows foreigners to do in China, but also in terms of, ex of expressing its culture with international space. Now, I think that, uh, you know, this is a personal view. Um, uh, I think there's a real struggle going on in China about the extent to which China can afford to be open to the outside world. And that is driven by and large by a fear for the long-term future of the, the, the Chinese Communist Party. And that ultimately becomes, a, I think, a, a political dialogue. Um, do you believe that the long-term uh, position of one-party rule in China is, uh, is an inevitable uh, uh, asset for China? Um, the Communist Party would argue that that one-party rule is an essential for uh, both the um, uh, continued growth of prosperity in China, but also for stability, and it's largely an argument around stability. Or do you believe that uh, there is inevitability, that the, 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 the linkage between China's prosperity, its openness to the rest of the world, inevitably will bring a challenge to that one-party rule over a period of time? And that ultimately is what the Chinese uh, officials, the party officials actually believe themselves, that, that there is that challenge. Um, uh, and I think that there is in some senses almost that same argument going on that must have gone in the, on in the Ming court at the point where they actually burnt the armada uh, of ships to prevent people going overseas. You know, you became, the law was you were not allowed to sail beyond the sight of land from China as a, as a Chinese national. Um, uh, and I think there's a real, a real challenge within China's thinking around this. Um, uh, ideally, I think uh, people would like to have all the benefits of international trade, um, all the benefits of other people buying their goods, um, without, all the dis without any of the disbenefits of being open. And to a an ex certain extent, and this is an argument you have to be extremely wary about, um, the Opium Wars were a gruesome and an awful uh, expression of a massive uh, trade imbalance between China and essentially the, the Indian Empire, um, the British Indian Empire. And that, that, that sense that you can actually export, but you don't need to be part of that world, I think is a big challenge that China still faces. Um, on the questions around uh, cost and creativity, um, you know, I, I also say, saw David vigorously shaking his head. Um, uh, I think the really interesting question is how do we in ensure a, the, and engender long-term creative education for all our people, no matter where they come from and no matter what their education level. So I would absolutely agree. This isn't just about uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the finest graduates of, of our, our best uh, uh, edu creative education schools or, or higher education institutions. It's got to be down through the entire education system because you actually have to have feedstock. Um, unless you are building the capacity of people to be creative. And it's, not also, it's also, not, for me, not just about... Um, uh, professionals, whether those are professional artists, you know, fantastic, although all of that is a vital part of our creativity. But creativity has to be a part of everybody's experience, life experience and work experience, if we are going to be able to, to be truly uh, a, a country which, which makes the most of the assets we've got. Now, believe it or not, we're coming up to our, our final question. So. Uh, yes, uh, Mohammed Bin Madani, uh, Maghrib Review. I am one of your best friends. I believe I'm one of your best friends. Given the fact that uh, British 
economy, relies entirely on our services and no longer an industrial power. How do you see your future in 50 years, in 50 years time? There you are. Well, gosh. Just <laughs> I'm going to ask you a smaller, a smaller time <laughs> question in a moment. But, yeah. um, I, I think um, there's no question that the services are vitally important for the, for, for the, the uh, British economy. I think we tend to overestimate the, the decline in, in, in our manufacturing um, and that there remain very considerable manufacturing assets in this country. Um, uh, but that, in all aspects, it seems to me that creativity, uh, as long as it's not creativity in finances, um, uh, is a vital component of the sort of future that we want to build for, for our country. So undoubtedly creative uh, services, but also uh, the design, excellence. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we're doing at the moment is working with, with Thomas Heatherwick on, on a design show. Um, it is, he is a massive figure around Asia just coming out of the, the, the pavilion that he built for the, the Shanghai Expo, mm. which was the most wonderful experience. I have to tell you, just an anecdote, the reason that he built that fabulous building was because we didn't have enough money to actually fill this huge space the Chinese gave us. So we needed a really creative response to that. <laughs> and my goodness, he came up with it in, in, in spades. But it's that sort of creativity, whether that is through the, the new uh, buses in London, like them or hate them, you know, I'll leave that to you. But that sort of creativity, that design excellence, which comes back into manufacturing and is reflected back into the design is, is a, a virtuous circle, which seems to me to be vitally important for our future. Thank you, and something the RSA cares deeply about. I'm going to have to go to my, my last question, which is, it's your last three months at the British Council. Um, and, and I wanted to ask what you hope for its future. What would you wish to leave as a message on your desk to your successor for the British Council? Well, I have a horrible feeling I might have to leave that, that famous one which says there's no more money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the real message. What would be the fantasy wish that you would wish? <laughs> I think what we're trying to do as an organisation... Um, is a really, really important thing, which is we are trying to remain a genuine public service organisation, recognising that our government at the moment does not wish to, and any future government is unlikely to wish to, spend the sorts of money that we believe are necessary to be able to, for, to take forward the sort of work that we do. And that puts us into a place where we actually have to do things differently. We talk about ourselves as an entrepreneurial public service. And that is a really important phrase for me. It's a bit plonking, I recognise. But it's really important that we remain a public service delivering public value and that we're able to articulate that was, what that is, while at the same time recognising that the way that we do that is going to have to change and change radically in this more challenging financial environment that we're working in. So we now have to earn uh, more than 80% of our turnover ourselves. Um, that places huge constraints on us, but also huge opportunities. Um, and I hope that my successor will want to continue to grow the organisation 